Hi, so I'm Hazel, I'm the Senior Conservation Officer here at Wildwood and I'm going to talk to you today about some bats as we've had lots of requests from you for information about our bats. So today I have Daisy with me and she's a brown longed bat. Now unfortunately Daisy can't be released back into the wild because she was injured by a cat and that's why she is in captivity because all bats in this country are protected species so we can only keep them um, if we have a special license and they can't be returned to the wild. Now Daisy is a brown long-eared bat and she has very large ears. At the moment they're just curled up because she's resting but if she were flying she would pump blood into those ears and they'd be sticking right up above her head because bats use their ears to find their way around basically to see in the dark because they use something called echolocation and that's when they shout really high-pitched squeaks at objects and listen for the echoes that bounce back so for example if i was um, shouting just at the side of the cage behind me here it's very close to me so my echo would hit the mesh there and bounce back very quickly so i know it's very close but if I were to shout right to the end of the cage here, it would take much longer for the sound to hit the cage and come back to me. And so I know it's much further away. Now it's much more complicated than that when bats use echolocation, but it's similar principles. They can find their way around. They can tell what shape and size an object is, how far away it is, how dense it is, if it's moving, just by those sound waves that come back to them. And they have special enlarged auditory area of their brain that interprets all those sound waves and turns them into a sort of a picture which we can't even imagine. Mm. So Daisy has very large ears because she eats insects such as moths, spiders and daddy long legs. So she's brilliant pest control, eats up all those insects that we don't really like. Um, but the problem is the insects have become very clever and they've learned to hear her echolocation. And so the moths have developed ears in their knees of all places. And when a bat approaches, they hear the bat's echolocation and they dive out of the way. So the bat can't catch them. So she has learned to echolocate really, really quietly. So she's often called the whispering bat because of that. And so because she echolocates quietly, she needs even bigger ears to be able to hear her echoes come back. Um, she'll also take insects off leaves. So if you're lucky enough to see brown long ears flying in the evening, you might see them hovering around a tree, like a big old oak tree, taking insects off of leaves and branches. So each year, hundreds of bats get into trouble in Kent. Uh, they get injured by cats, by flying into things on a windy night, by being hit by cars, or they have illnesses, or they are starving because there aren't enough insects around, and they end up on the ground where people find them. And they get brought to me um, at Wildwood, but also to members of Kent Bat Group, um, who are bat care volunteers. And the reason why we built the flight cage here is so that we can rehabilitate these bats and this is a partnership project with the Kent Bat Group and the bats come into the cage to get flight practice so bats such as Daisy who might have had an injury once they've recovered come here to build up their strength and their fitness so and for us to be able to assess them to see if they're ready to return to the wild because we have to know that they can fly really strongly before they can be released. Uh, we also have young bats which are sadly orphaned each year um, or get lost and we can't find their mums so we can't return them to to their mums and those bats have to be hand reared which is quite a difficult job it means feeding them every few hours on a special puppy milk um, and once they're fully grown they have to learn all the skills that they need to cope in the wild. Now in the wild, their mums would teach them how to do this. They would fly out in the evening following their mum. They'd watch how she echolocates. They'd listen to her echolocation. They'd watch her catching insects. They'd watch how she flies and gradually learn. And while they're doing that, their mum would still be feeding them milk because bats are mammals. So they suckle their young on milk, just like humans do. Um, and they would get plenty of practice, but they wouldn't starve. But if we were to release them as soon as they were fully grown, 
they would starve before they'd learnt to catch insects well enough. So we have to give them a few weeks or more in the cage here where they can learn to catch insects. So we have a moth light, which you can see behind me, which is blue, um, and that attracts tiny insects like mosquitoes and midges into the cage, which the bats can practice catching. Um, it's also a safe environment, so if they crash a few times where they're learning to fly, that's okay, we can rescue them. And so they can gradually build up their flying skills um, until we can release them. And we do something called a soft release where we put them in a bat box which has plenty of food and water. We move that to the outside of the cage um, and then they can release themselves, but they can come back for food if they want to. But if we know where the bats came from originally, like if it's an adult bat that's been injured, we always take them back to where they came from. So we only carry out a soft release for young bats where we don't know where their, their family is, their colony that they live with. It's important that bats do get released back to where they came from because they are very social animals. They live in family groups, uh, particularly females, and they know the local area. They know where there's good places to feed. They know where different buildings or trees are that they can roost in in the summer, but they also know where good places are to hibernate in the winter. And so if a bat is released into an area it doesn't know, it could waste a lot of energy trying to find those things and may not survive. Now, if you find a bat outside during the daytime on a wall or on the ground, or if your cat brings a bat in, it needs urgent help. It means that there's a problem. Bats should be tucked away somewhere inside a building or a tree um, during the daytime somewhere safe. So if they're outside, they have a problem, an injury, or they're starving. So the best thing to do is to call the bat helpline, uh, which you can find online or if you're local to Wildwood, you can call us here um, and someone will give you some advice about what to do with the bats or come and collect the bats. Um, many bats get injured by cats, unfortunately. Um, poor Daisy here um, has lost part of her wing because a cat injured it. So you can see on this side, much of her wing is missing. And that means that she can, can't fly. And unfortunately, she's had to stay in captivity with me for about eight years. Um, and she can never go back to the wild. So if you do have a cat that catches lots of wildlife, particularly bats, then what we advise is if you can, try to keep your cat in all night. If you can't do that, then try to bring your cat in about half an hour before dusk. Perhaps make that its feeding time, give it some treats so that it comes inside and just keep it in till about an hour after dusk. Um, and that will save lots of bats' lives because that's the time when the bats are most active um, and that's when they're hungry, they've been inside the roost all night, um, they're very, very hungry, they're coming out, they might be mothers with babies and they need to feed so they can produce milk for their babies. And so they're, they're less aware of the cats being around, they might take more risks um, and they fly lower as well when they first come out of roosts, particularly buildings. And many cats can actually hear the bats' echolocation and they will climb up onto roofs and unfortunately use their paws to swap the bats as the bats come out. And just one or two scratches from a cat's claw or bites from a cat's tooth can be fatal to a tiny bat, unfortunately. So if you can do that, that would really help. Uh, one of the questions we've been asked by you is whether bats make nests. That's a really good question. They are very different from birds. Um, they are mammals and they roost in places like buildings and trees and some species caves, barns, churches. Most of our bats actually like to be in houses like we do because it's nice and warm and dry. So they might be just under the tiles on the roof or under weatherboards on the outside of the house or inside the attic itself, but they don't make any nests. They don't bring any material in, they don't chew anything. They literally just hang there. They squeeze into very tiny cracks and crevices. You can see how tiny Daisy is, and she's one of our bigger bats. So most of our bats are much smaller than this, and you could fit maybe several hundred of them into one shoebox. So they really just squeeze into a tight space where they sleep um, during the daytime, and that's it. So. If you have bats using your house, don't worry, they won't cause any problems at all. And the added bonus is they'll eat all the mosquitoes and midges in your garden during the summer so that you can sit outside on a warm evening. So bats are very long-lived mammals. Uh, the record for 
the oldest spat in Europe is 43 years, which is amazing really for something this tiny. If you think of the equivalent of a shrew or mouse this size or, or a little bit bigger, they would only live for perhaps two years at the most. Um, and the reason why bats live a long time is partly because they only have one or at the most two babies a year, so sometimes they have twins. And so they have to live a long time to produce enough young during their lifetime. And they don't usually breed until they're about three years old, we think. Um, but also they have amazing um, genetics and researchers are actually studying this at the moment to see if they can find cures for human diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer because bats don't seem to age. As they get older, they have genes that switch on that help to protect them from all the, the problems of aging that humans experience. So we find that the ends of their chromosomes don't wear away like they do in, in humans and other animals. Um, they seem to stay intact and um, they don't seem to have problems with inflammation from diseases and things like that. So they're pretty amazing creatures and it would be really nice if we could find a cure from bats for some of our problems. There are lots of myths about bats. A lot of people don't like them, which is a real shame because they're very useful animals to have around. And one of those myths is that bats get caught in your hair. Now, that myth probably came from the fact that if you're out in the evening in the summer, your head is very warm and you attract insects such as mosquitoes and midges that want to bite you. So you have a little cloud of insects over your head. Now the bats spot those with their echolocation and they will fly towards it and swoop down and try to eat them. And that's why you might think the bat's aiming at your head. It's not, it's just actually taking away all those insects for you. Um, there, are, there are other uh, myths like bats suck your blood. Well, there are three species of vampire bat in the world which do feed on blood, but they're only found in Central and South America. And they really feed on animals in the rainforest such as deer and birds and just take a very tiny amount of blood. Um, so they're not really going to affect us. But bats are very, very useful because many of our bats eat insects and all of our bats in the UK eat insects. They're amazing pest control. One tiny pipistrelle bat can eat 3,000 mosquitoes and midges every single night. And there are bats in other parts of the world which each eat more insects. And it's been estimated that bats just on corn crops worldwide save farmers one billion dollars a year um, on pesticide use. So if we didn't have bats we'd be putting more and more chemicals into our environment and we'd have fewer crops as well. Uh, bats in the tropics also pollinate plants so they're very important for regenerating our rainforests but also for pollinating our crops. Um, things like tequila uh, come from agave plants which are pollinated by bats. If we didn't have bats we would have no more tequila. <laughs> in the UK there are 18 species of bats and in Kent we had 14 until last year when a species which previously had been thought to be extinct was rediscovered in the county. But all our species of bats in the UK are protected by law because they've all been threatened and their numbers have declined in the past. Uh, the main threats to bats are things like habitat loss, so loss of foraging areas where they can catch their food, uh, changes to their roosts, so particularly in Kent, conversions to barns and oast houses where they traditionally roosted uh, if bats aren't taken into account, and also changes in agriculture, so use of pesticides which not only kill the insects they feed on but also can poison the bats as well. Um, and the fact that our farms have changed, so rather than being small farms with hedgerows with lots of insects, we have huge industrial farms uh, with just monocultures of one crop. So the diversity of insects there is very, very poor. And finally, climate change is a real issue for bats as well because they're very weather dependent species. So they like nice warm summers where they can go out feeding on insects and nice cold winters where they can sleep all the way through but we're finding our winters are becoming warmer, our summers are becoming wetter and windier and they can't really cope with all these changes which don't fit in with their natural life cycle. <laughs>